Good morning and welcome to Mass STEM Week. My name is Heather Darby with the Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board and the Metro North STEM Network. Um, uh, welcome, welcome everyone. Glad you could uh, make it out to this early Friday morning for our uh, latest STEM Week panel. Uh, ooh, wrong panel, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, the, the title is incorrect, but this is the um, uh, artificial intelligence panel. Um, did you know? Uh, this is being brought to you in partnership with BrainCo, iRobot, Lesley University, Mass Hire Metro North Workforce Board, and uh, Metro North STEM Network. At this time, I'd like to introduce the panel. We have joining us today, uh, Natrice Gaskins, PhD. Uh, Professor Gaskins, a, a Baltimore native, is Assistant Director of the STEAM Learning Lab at Lesley University. She earned her uh, BFA in Computer Graphics with honors from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York in 1992 and an MFA in Art and Technology from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1994. Um, Natrice worked uh, for several years in K-12 and post-secondary education, uh, communication media, community media, sorry, and technology before en enrolling in Georgia Tech where she received a doctorate in digital media in 2014. And Natrice uh, proposed a model for techno vernacular creativity as an area of practice that investigates the characteristics of this production and its application in STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics learning. Uh, Christina Lieber is a, a principal data software engineer at iRobot. Uh, she is passionate about learning how people use data and leveraging that information to design and build systems that enable them to do so effectively. Uh, Christina received her BSCS from the University of New Hampshire and her MSCS uh, from the uh, Georgia Institute of Technology. She's previously worked for Amazon, GE Global Research, and uh, GE Global Research and MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and holds two patents. Uh, Lauren Stern is a design researcher at iRobot as well, uh, where she focuses on research efforts related to robot behavior and interactions specific to the home environment. Prior to her time at iRobot, uh, Lauren's UX work um, focused on research and design of collaborative analysis tools for government and uh, business agencies. When not conducting research, she enjoys reading, dancing, and board games. Uh, Joshua Varela is the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships at BrainCo. He's a member of NeuroMaker, the educational division of BrainCo. Josh works directly with uh, district leaders across the Eastern uh, United States to develop STEM programs, leveraging emerging technology. His mission is to democratize uh, STEM, CTE, and CS, which calls for these solutions to be accessible, equitable, and inclusive throughout the country. He is a proud son of two diasporas, born to a Puerto Rican father and an Ashkenazi Jewish mother raised in New York City. I'll be your uh, moderator for today. I'm gonna stop sharing screens now so we can uh, get started. Um, so welcome everyone. And um, I wanna start off the event by asking you to uh, please elaborate on your current role. They all sound so fascinating. Um, and uh, while elaborating on your current role, could you tell us how your role allows you to engage with students? 
and we could start off. I'm just going to go by how we're presented on my screen. Josh, if you could uh, go first. Thank you, Heather. Well, uh, my role <laughs> is to work pretty closely with students. Uh, being uh, one of the co-founders of Neuromaker, which is the educational division of BrainCo, we work with school leaderships and districts to bring different methods of uh, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, uh, data science into the classroom. So what we do, we take technology that we've done in industry and we've created different programs and solutions that revolve around assistive technology. Uh, and for us, it's about how do you uh, incorporate ideas like from the engineer design process and then take our prototype designs and create your own. Uh, so for us, we work very closely with, with schools and with students because we have our creative challenge. And in this creative challenge, we really love to see what students are able to do uh, with prototyping and redesigning brain computer interface technologies and also uh, pros advanced prosthetic robotics technology. So very closely with the students and overall, it's a great experience just to see them have these hands-on learning experiences uh, leveraging our industry technology. Uh, thanks, Josh. And just a, a quick follow-up question, if you don't mind. Can you tell us a bit more about the technology that you use? Yeah, sure. So our company uh, creates advanced prosthetic robotics that leverage machine learning. Uh, so for example, upper limb prosthetics. So as you can see, your hands. <laughs> so what we do there, we create uh, advanced robotic prosthetics that have unlimited gestures. So it's a fancy way of saying they can move as different ways like this because when you have other prosthetics prior, they only can do certain hand motions and gestures. Uh, and then our other division leveraged brain computer interface technology. Uh, so just a fancy way of saying your brain can control hardware, software, uh, or the things around you. And we leverage this technology within industry to neuro-optimize uh, company. So for example, we work with Formula Racing and they use our technology to help their drivers get into flow states. But we've also seen really uh, impactful work within assistive technology because we have to think about things like, for example, uh, if you're paralyzed from the neck down, if you're non-communicative, how are you use how are you communicating and working with the world around you? And that's where we see brain computer interface really being able to change uh, and improve quality of life for people day in day out. That's so fantastic. I love the articulated hand. I know we've spoken about that a bit and that uh, I think that's really cool. Uh, thanks for sharing, Josh. Uh, Netrice, could you um, please elaborate on your current role and how that allows you to engage with students? Yeah, um, we, I'm um, at the Leslie STEAM Learning Lab um, at Leslie University. It's a center designed to um, research new opportunities for learning through engagement and inquiry-based ex exploration. Um, we embrace the maker way of knowing, so it's a place where students and community partners play, tinker, design, and create. And so um, for the pandemic, we were largely uh, virtual. And so we did a lot of virtual workshops with both uh, K to 12 students and um, their educators and youth workers. Um, we also did a summer uh, four-week dual enrollment summer um, course Art, AI, and Robotics at Somerville High School, and that was in person. We co-designed um, the, the project, the, the course with uh, Somerville High School students, and the students received uh, high school and uh, college credit um, for that class. And the capstone was to produce a, um, an art bot or a robot that makes art. And so many of the students were able to do that, and um, I'll put a link in the chat for people to read more about it. Uh, thanks so much. Um, in the meantime, could you just, could you give us a sneak peek into what some of those robots were that they made, how they made them? Sure. Um, there is a, um, a painter bot, an art bot where it paints um, based on AI. So it has a, a body sensing um, AI that basically allows you the, the bot to paint. And then there's a Kraken monster that paints um, there's a crab that draws, um, a butterfly. The butterfly one is collaborative. So the butterfly draws and you draw the butterfly response and by drawing more and can create a composition together. And that was done by a couple of 
students, including one from Brazil. Um, so, and, and then there was a ladybug that drew flowers or drew, um, you know, a, a flower design. So uh, we modified the scratch programming language. A member of our team at Leslie's team, uh, Craig Hanning is a part of the scratch team at MIT Media Lab. So um, we were definitely um, looking to uh, push the boundaries of what scratch could do and also what we could do with art and, and AI through robotics. That must have been an extraordinarily wonderful experience for the students. Um, we do a lot of work with Somerville High, and so we're, we're happy to hear that our students are so involved. Um, Christine, uh, could you please elaborate on your current role and if and how that allows you to engage with students? Sure. So um, as, as uh, Heather said earlier, I'm a data engineer, so my job is less about like AI analytics, data science, and more about the structuring the data and developing the tooling that allows those people to do the things that they do. Uh, because if the data is not there, if the data is of poor quality, if the data is not structured in a way that's easy to interact with, it really makes it hard for AI scientists to do all of the smart things that they do. And if they don't have the tools to allow them to actually do that effectively, then again, it's very difficult for them to do the things that they do. So in managing and maintaining the data that AI scientists and data scientists need, there's a lot of engineering challenges around just how we do that. And that's what I focus on um, at iRobot. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, iRobot is the company behind the Roomba robot vacuum cleaner. Um, so you can probably imagine some of the, the ways that we need to like train those robots and train our digital experiences utilizing uh, data. So. There's plenty of stuff there. Um, as far as how that allows me to work with students, we do hire college interns and I do, I have mentored um, students in the past who have been working with us and also getting the opportunity to do panels like this and outreach to, to students through events like this. That's so wonderful. I'm glad you um, mentioned the robot. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, Lauren, uh, same question. Uh, please elaborate on your current role and how you engage with students through that role. Good morning. Um, so Good as morning. Christina mentioned, we work on um, Roomba. Um, and in my role as a design researcher, I'm supporting kind of how the robot is going to function in a human space, in a human home, and how humans are going to interact with that robot. And so when we talk about artificial intelligence in particular, there's a lot of decisions that the robot is making every you know, minute that it's cleaning your house and how we communicate those decisions back to the person who owns the house or who is in that space and how we ensure that they can um, communicate with the robot either to tell it something that they wanted to do differently or that they want to change and so that they understand what decision the robot is making and why that's really important for just the overall experience of using our robots. And also when we start getting into some of the more advanced capabilities um, like the Roomba J7, which launched in September and that I was one of the researchers for, that robot um, can take pictures of objects that it detects in your home and share those back to you so you can give the robot feedback. And that opens up a bunch of questions about privacy and informing people about the decisions that the robot is making so that they can make the right decisions for their home. So um, that's all part of the, the research that I do. Um, in terms of education and working with kids, we also always have an intern or co-op on our team, which is super fun. They get to run their own projects as part of that program. So they're helping support the work that we're doing and picking a topic that's really interesting to them and leading that project. So they get to experience that part as well. And then we also have an educational robot that helps you learn to code called Root um, that iRobot um, builds. And so I do in-person programs with student groups where we bring Root or if the school already has some, then we'll use them to do um, different projects learn coding there, um, as well as doing more virtual things either like this or doing visits with school groups. So it's kind of a range um, depending on the age ages that we're doing stuff with that day. Uh, thanks so much. Could, could you tell us a little bit about um, the type of coding that uh, Groot uh, does? Yeah, so Root uses um, a drag and drop interface. It has coding tiles. Um, so it 
it has different levels. At the basic level, it's more visual. It uses basic kind of if this, then that language so that you mm -hmm. can set it up to do basic functions. And then as you get more comfortable with coding principles, you can move through the levels of the user interface, what it looks like on the screen when you're programming. Um, and the middle level starts to introduce more advanced concepts like looping. Um, and then by the final level, you're looking at the code itself um, so that you can get more comfortable with it. There's also a little simulation later, this whole program is available for free online um, at the iRobot education website. So you don't actually have to own the robot to do it. There's a simulator with an animated robot that'll show you your program and kind of what the robot would do. Um, but if you have a robot or when I'm coming, I bring a big box of robots with us so that we can play with them. Um, they connect via Bluetooth to a computer or a tablet so that you can see the robot run your program in real time. Wow, that's that's amazing. I think um, maybe next year for each of you, I'll have to uh, reach out to you for in-person demos, uh, wishing and dreaming and hoping we get back to in-person uh, STEM week. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Um, I want to turn the conversation um, slightly um, to, to, to ask a little bit about your background and how you got into the career that you have today. So, um, Josh, I'm going to start with you again. Um, as a child uh, growing up in uh, New York, how did your environment influence your path, your career path? Yeah, uh, so my career story is probably uh, a little unorthodox. <laughs> uh, my background is actually liberal arts education. Uh, growing up, though, uh, you could see how tech was just happening everywhere around you. Uh, and I always was gravitated towards technology. So even though I had a liberal arts background, uh, I saw when you know the iPhone first hit the market, what that was like, people were queuing up for these things. I saw how technology was becoming more and more a part of everyday life in our society. And uh, through my experience, the only thing that can really solve problems quickly and also create problems is technology. Uh, so from there, I worked for Samsung Electronics America. And at that time with Samsung Electronics America, uh, I worked predominantly within the emerging tech market. And what we were looking at is, you know, how are users adopting this technology? How are they using this technology? Where, where is it going to be a part of their everyday lives? And how do we make it something that can go to market? How do you make something that you actually can get society to adopt? Uh, and for me, you know, I saw the impact of what technology does for people in their daily lives. And uh, when I decided to come up here and change career paths a bit even further, I knew I wanted to work in a company that was using technology for good. And there's nothing better in my mind about it than assistive technology, because technology is is really about improving that quality of life. And if I was to look back and talk to my childhood self now, uh, my whole life has been a, a big chunk of it has been advocacy and education uh, and creating access to technology. Uh, one of my faith, one of my projects that I did when I was growing up was uh, getting asylum seekers and refugees certificate programs through Samsung Electronics America, uh, because I understood that most of people's lives now are on their phones. We, we cherish our phones more than we cherish almost any other object we have. And the reason for that is uh, we do everything on it. And that's something I saw around me growing up when I saw these lineups everywhere and people adopting these devices. Uh, and it comes full circle uh, now. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. I can uh, definitely agree with you on the good and the bad of technology. I have to uh, continuously balance keeping my child away from technology while having have him use it to, to further his education. So um, that aspect I can definitely relate to. Thanks for sharing your backstory. Um, Natrice, could you please uh, tell us, answer the same question as a child growing up um, in Baltimore? Um, how did you how did your environment influence your career path um, i was born in baltimore but i was raised in louisville kentucky um so my mother was a computer programmer analyst i did not like computers at all i knew i wanted to be an artist and it was my high school ceramics teacher who taught my, me my first computer graphics class 
Um, so it was my high school art teacher who introduced me to computer graphics and that was 1988, 87. Um, and then that led to me majoring in computer graphics at Pratt and eventually getting my digital media PhD. So um, that early experience in high school where I was, my major was visual arts and um, getting into computer graphics through my art teacher helped me to create a new path for myself that didn't really exist anywhere else that I knew of. Um, so I didn't go to, I didn't go into industry at all. I actually went into community-based um, work for most, most, almost 20 years before I went back to school. Um, but I have, uh, in addition to the work that I do at Leslie University, I'm an artist who um, has a, um, an exhibition at the Smithsonian next month. Um, it's called Futures, and um, 11 of my artificial intelligence artworks are going to be in that exhibition. Um, so I, uh, oftentimes I, I've been finding a lot of people want me to exhibit the work. And then there's um, my scholarship. I am working on a field report on artificial intelligence and art for the Social Science Research Council. So um, I have a book out that came out uh, in August uh, through MIT Press, which is Techno Vernacular, Creativity and Innovation. Um, so I kind of balance those three realities, the, the teacher, scholar, and then the artist. Um, and, uh, and we also got uh, on the artist side, a, a grant from the Mozilla Foundation to interrogate artificial intelligence. And I work with two other people, an uh, um, architect from Trinidad and a dancer from, um, from Barbados um, on a, a, a carnival AI application that uh, celebrates carnival by using AI and dance to uh, create art. So, um, and that's uh, launched in September. And thanks so much, Natrice. I am particularly interested in the uh, carnival AI. Uh, thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, Christina, could you answer the same question, please? Um, I'm not exactly sure where you grew up, but if you could share with us uh, uh, how that environment um, influenced your career path and exactly where that was. Sure. So I grew up in a very small town in Vermont um, and actually had perhaps a little bit of a different experience in that my grade school and my high school did not have any programming classes at all. Um, so my first programming class was actually in college. Um, I, the town I grew up in is so small, like the entirety of the time that I lived there while growing up, the best we had was dial-up internet. We got DSL when I was in college. You still can't get cable in this town because it is too small. There's no companies that will run the, the wires there. So if you want internet or television, it is, you know, high-speed DSL or satellite internet or satellite TV plus, um, you know, rabbit ears, assuming that you've got something powerful enough on your roof to get the, the signals. Um, so for me, declaring computer science as my major going into school was kind of a, well, I like logic and I like math and I like science that kind of, and tech is cool. That seems like it's kind of a, a fun combination of all of these things. Let me just try that. But I wasn't completely sold on it. So I actually, um, I went to the University of New Hampshire for my undergraduate. I was actually accepted as both a computer science major and a clarinet major. And going into like music or some other field was actually my backup plan if I got into computer science and decided, wow, this is not for me. Um, but it turned out I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and obviously I'm still doing it. Um, but then as far as how like getting into data engineering, data engineering as a field didn't exist there. So Josh mentioned the iPhone. I was in college when the iPhone came out. So data and, and data engineering was not at all what it was. You might see somebody who was like, owns a, a relational database, but nothing on the scale of what we have today. So um, when I went to graduate school, I actually declared, I actually thought I wanted to be an AI researcher and scientist. And my focus area in my master's program was AI and uh, was AI and machine learning, actually focusing that in natural language processing. Um, and then as I started doing that in school, I realized I hated training models. Um, just not something that I enjoyed. The technology was very cool, but the actual like nuts and bolts of what I was doing was not something I enjoyed. I kind of lucked into my last semester taking a class on web search and text mining, which is basically how do search engines work like Google. Um, and I found that to be fascinating with how do we actually use this data and actually fit together a system where the intelligence classifier is one of the things in the system in order to do a thing that real people can use. 
that I thought that I thought was really cool. And since then, I've been able to focus my career sort of in that direction as the field of data engineering has has grown up over the last several years. Thanks so much. I love how you took uh, what was seemingly a gap in your education and just your exposure in general and made it all your own and took that and made it into an entire career. That's so awesome. Um, Lauren, could you please answer the same question as a child growing up in your community? How did it, how did it affect um, your career path? Yeah, so um, I haven't made it very far. I was born in Boston, um, so I'm, I'm pretty local. Um, I actually, though, despite being in a great, really technical city, um, never thought about technology as something that I was going to do as a career. Um, I've always really loved history and growing up in New England, there is a lot of history here that I think is very um, front and center, kind of just when you walk around. Um, and I've I actually started working in museums as a museum educator and researcher as a teenager. That was my first job in high school. Um, and I actually still work at a museum on the weekends. Um, history has always been something that I've loved and been really passionate about. And through that work, I really grew to value human stories and thinking about kind of where we came from and how that informs our sort of socio-political landscape today. Um, and that's where I found technology, actually. I've always been really fascinated by the way that technology has influenced culture. Um, and you see that in the 19th century industrial revolution. You see that um, in other time periods as well. Um, and so that was sort of my avenue in. Um, when I was in college doing my undergraduate, I also have a liberal arts background. Um, and I actually went for writing. I thought that I wanted to write and be a storyteller. Um, and I really still love those things. And they ended up being a huge part of my job in research. We are all about telling human stories to help us build better technology. Um, but I realized when I started as a writer that I was really focused on what was going on inside my characters' heads. I was really thinking about their sort of psychological experience. And so I ended up shifting my studies to cognitive psychology, um, which is what I concentrated in. So when I graduated, I was working in a lab doing psychological research. My um, research uh, for my undergraduate thesis was on social perception. So thinking about how our memories and identity of self influence our social decision making and how we understand and empathize with other people. And so I was continuing in that kind of area doing work on moral decision making and memory. Um, and then <laughs> really didn't like working in a lab. I wanted to do something that felt more applied that wasn't all about focusing on, you know, publishing theory and working on papers. Um, and so I was looking for something else. I was having a crisis. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I was kind of applying for any job that I could find that wanted someone with a psych background. Um, and I ended up in user experience UX. The position that I got was with a, a group that did work for the government, um, working on a program that helped soldiers do cross-cultural communication in non-combat situations. For example, going in and doing disaster relief efforts. How do you communicate with local populations and um, understand how to help them more effectively? Because coming in as an American, what we think is going to work isn't the right way to communicate a lot of the time and isn't the, the best cultural fit. So they were developing software that could help soldiers kind of learn about this process and understand how to communicate better. And they that team had decided that it would be much easier to hire someone with a psychology background and teach them user experience design than it would be to hire a user experience expert and teach them psychology, which is why uh, they were looking for someone with my background. And um, I was lucky enough to get that job and it kind of totally changed what I did with my life. I really fell in love with user experience as a field and with research in particular, which was a big part of that job. Um, we went and did a lot of work um, with army training and sort of ethnographic research with the soldiers to better understand their context and how to effectively communicate with them through this software. Um, and so I ended up, while I was working, going back and doing a part-time master's degree um, in the field of human factors um, and information design so that I sort of had the, the foundational knowledge down for the field that I was already working in. Um, that was something that was important to me to do, but definitely isn't required. Um, and then from there, I had a couple of, of other jobs before I landed at iRobot, but they were all kind of in that um, sort of 
enterprise space. And what I had learned through those positions is that I really wanted to be somewhere where I felt like I was making a difference in a positive way to the people around me. And so iRobot as a company, that's kind of their whole thing. That's what they want to do. They build robots to empower people. Um, and I, I had, my parents had a Roomba when I was a kid, like one of the really early ones, because my dad likes technology and he thought it was cool. He didn't think it cleaned very well, but it was like his toy. Basically we named it Potter. It had a spot in our house. We made it like a little house and a sign. Um, and so that had kind of, I, I remembered that. And that was why I applied for the job. Um, and it's been great to be able to kind of take not only what I love about people and humans and apply that to technology, but also my mom is a teacher. I come from a family of educators and I robot has this really strong education connection. And so it's been fun to get to pull that back around. Um, the user experience team at iRobot now goes to my mom's school every year in LOL and has a program. Um, so it's been nice to make that connection. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love the um, sort of themes that uh, have been um, going around this, the, the answers to this question, you know, that it's, it's okay if you don't know what you want to do, even when you're finishing uh, high school. It's good to know, but it's okay if you don't. It's, it's okay to uh, step out and then learn and realize, oh, no, this is definitely not what I want to do. And um, find your path through that route. And, and also how, you know, just how influential, whether your actual environment or your relationships have been on the path you ended up taking and, and bringing you to where you are today. So thanks so much for sharing those backstories. Um, I want to turn now and, and ask, uh, what do you absolutely love about your job that you want to share with students today? And uh, I, we can uh, start in reverse. We can start with Lauren this time. So I think my short answer to this is playing with robots is really fun. Um, I think the longer answer is the people that I work with, honestly. Like everybody cares so much about building something that is helpful, that makes life better. Um, and it's, a, it's just really fun to work with other people who also care that much. Um, and get to kind of explore like, what can we do that's different? What can we do that improves on what we're doing now? Um, it's a really great place to experiment and to try new things. For Halloween every year, we build these really crazy decorations and experiences for, uh, for kids to be able to come in and trick or treat in the office. Like there's all these ways that we get to apply our interest in design and um, in experience outside of just robots, but really kind of being on a team that's willing to take those risks is really fun. Thank you. Christina? Um, for me, um, one of the things that, like, as I mentioned, when I, when I uh, joined the field of computer science, I wasn't sure about it. One of the things that kept me in it is I like solving problems. I like having a, we need to, to find technology that will do a thing and make the technology do this thing. How do we do it? How do we actually accomplish this thing that maybe hasn't been done before, hasn't been done in quite the in quite this way, and just being able to dive in and solve that problem? Um, well, as Lauren said, working with a bunch of smart people in a very collaborative fashion, I really enjoy um, all of those sorts of things. Thank you. Natrice, could you uh, tell us uh, like what you really, really love about your job that you want to share with students? Um, I don't really have one job, so um, true. <laughs> uh, I do like the the uh, flexibility I have in my current job at Leslie because it is STEAM, and a lot of what I do crosses over into that. So um, some aspects of all the things, the art thing, the scholarship comes into play in my day job, um, so to speak, um, and working with teachers and students. And um, I teach, for example, I'm teaching robotics this um, term. Uh, starting in November uh, for Leslie uh, Graduate School of Ed students. And I taught coding over the summer. And so um, coding and design. And so uh, it's nice to be able to share with students, um, you know, what's happening and they get inspired and do really cool stuff. So that's one aspect of the job that I like is seeing um, when students uh, kind of take it in their own direction. Thank you so much. 
Um, Josh, I know there's a lot to love about your job. Tell us what, what's one of your top two or three. <laughs> I would say when it, the first time I saw an amputee get fitted with our prosthetic, that was probably like, oh, wow, we're doing something really different and impactful here. Uh, being able to see someone within five minutes learn how to pick up an object. Uh, and then when they come back in a few months, they're actually living a full quality of life experience where they're, they're driving their cars, they are using it within everyday life. And then the most meaningful part of that is, is when I see students take on our creative challenge and just come up with ideas that as an industry, we still have not solved. Uh, for example, the wrist is one of those things in upper limb prosthetics where companies are still trying to figure out the signal processing there because it's very messy on EMG. Uh, and also seeing uh, students try to figure out how to create a horizontal finger movement. Uh, because prosthetics aren't really that good at that. <laughs> so I, I love seeing the work that I do within our everyday, but I love seeing the ideas and concepts that students are able to create with our technology. The, one of the best ones I probably saw recently was a student in Maryland created an alert driving system technology leveraging brain-computer interface. So when uh, the brainwave data would go to a certain area, it would send a little haptic feedback to the driver to let them know, hey, you're you're disengaged, let's re-engage into driving. So seeing that innovation take place and creativity take place from the students is something that I love to see every day. Thank you uh, so much for that. Um, on to our, our next question. Um, and we're gonna turn to see your perspective for youth opportunities. Uh, what opportunities do you see for uh, young people in STEM and STEAM that they might not necessarily see as yet for themselves? Let's uh, start again with Josh. It's, uh, we're in the technological age, like COVID kind of put the accelerator on that in every single way we can think of, uh, good and bad. There are so many careers and opportunities that are unfulfilled right now within this field, simply because we don't have the talent, we don't have the workforce that can do those jobs and do those skills. And it's only gonna increase and get bigger and bigger in the next years to come. It's, it's a field where we need more local students. We need people here to be engaged in this technology, these ideas, because no matter what company you are now, even if you're an energy company, even if you're, you know, you're dealing within commodities, even if you're dealing within biotech, uh, there's, there's always going to be connection to artificial intelligence. That, that's the trends that we're seeing across the board. So the opportunities are going to be there for students to work in. And, and that doesn't mean necessarily you need to be an algorithm, you know, scientists or things like that personally you just need to be able to communicate with these folks like that's my big part of my job is to be able to work with my my data scientists to be able to work with my researchers and to just be able to communicate properly and effectively with them so just because you know you feel hey uh <laughs> I, I i don't really see myself in this field or see myself in that tech is everywhere and, and is in everything so because of that you can be a part of the STEM careers. And you don't have to be the engineer, but you can be the person who's helping bring those ideas and concepts to life and into market. And that's something that I love to do in my work and we need more people to do that. Oh, that's great to hear that you're gonna be needing a lot more of our students coming up. Um, Natrice, could you uh, share please um, any opportunities you see for students that they may not see for themselves as yet? So when we got the funding from Mozilla for the Carnival AI project, um, we hired um, for the data uh, scientist role, a former student of mine from Boston Arts Academy who majored in uh, visual arts, which is high school for the visual and performing arts. And uh, she had learned how to be a software engineer after graduating. Um, and she was able to uh, work on the Carnival AI to create the app. Um, and it was her first um, foray into AI. And so now she's um, thinking about how she can merge her visual arts background with what she's learning in software engineering for um, to create her own new career. 
Um, and that, that takes time because you actually have to get out in the world and get experience. So I know she's working um, in um, maybe software engineering to get that experience. She already has the visual arts experience. And at some point, opportunities will emerge where she'll be able to um, continue to build on what she's already done and hopefully use what she learned um, from the Carnival Project. And I say that for because it's the same for me. I didn't have a straightaway um, path. I knew I did not want to be a computer programmer. I knew I didn't. I thought I wanted to be an artist full time. Turned out technology had a, a, a bigger role for me. And so, um, and I didn't really resist that. I kind of just went in. But I think um, going in, starting somewhere, and then keeping in mind and finding opportunities to bring in the stuff that you're passionate about is really um, going to be important. So as AI begins to evolve, because it already has, and it already has all these different subsets. Um, so deep learning, machine learning, and then within that computer vision, and within that all kinds of other types of um, areas that people can go into, it just continues to uh, expand. And so there are a lot of opportunities for young people to be able to go and bring skills that they have um, into that space. That's wonderful. There's there's so much, there's so many advances and in, in, in growth um, in AI that, you know, that's a great space. Um, and I, I like how you were able to pay it forward with your student um, based on experiences from your past and just creating a whole new career for yourself. Um, Christina, please, could you elaborate uh, on the same question, opportunities that you see that students may not see for themselves as yet? Sure, um, I really just wanna echo what uh, Joshua and Natrice said. So it's a hard question to answer because the field is changing so much all the time. You know, I mentioned when I was in, in school, so I graduated from undergrad in 2007. Um, and when I was in undergrad, the iPhone came out, Facebook came out. So like mobile engineering as, as a field was not a thing. Data engineering was not a thing. Like AI wasn't quite what it was today because we didn't have like the, the computing power and everything behind it. So the field is just changing so frequently that um, like as you get into industry, to just get, I would suggest get a, a foundation in the basics of just like how, how to write good software, if that's the direction you want to go in or how, or just what is AI, what is the, some of the foundational stuff. And then as Natrice said, follow your passions, figure out what are the things that you like to do. And there's probably a place in tech for you to do that somewhere. Um, like you know, the, and there, there's all these different specializations like yes, data science, AI, but you know, mobile engineering, web, uh, uh, um, you know, building, building full stack applications, front end engineering, data engineering, um, a bunch that I'm not even thinking of. And then there, we haven't even gotten into things like embedded software. So writing software that goes on a Roomba or a Fitbit or, or some such just to make technology more and more ubiquitous. I think that that is probably where a lot of the opportunities are going to come in as computer moves, as, as technology and computation moves off of the computer and the phone and onto more and more devices like what Joshua does. And then the questions on how do people actually interact with it and how do we make sure that the products are, you know, good partners in your home and in your life. Um, you know, at iRobot, we have a product that people are taking into their home. So as Lauren has said, how do we make sure that that is a, a product that people want to use and that they can trust in their home. Um, there's all of these fields around, so like data privacy and understanding, um, you know, how do we avoid the creep factor on these devices that are becoming more and more ubiquitous? There's all of these different things that that people can do. So like, as Natri said, identify your passion. It can take you places in this field that not only may you not quite know that they exist yet, they may not actually exist yet, and it can be on you to, to create and drive that. Yep, that, that's wonderful. I, I really agree with that, too. Um, Lauren, uh, could you please uh, round up our answers on this uh, question? Sure, <laughs> I'm going to pick up the thread that everybody else has, has laid out. Um, sure. I agree with what's been said so far. I think the other thing that I'll add to carry on Christina's point is that there are so many related fields that are just starting that really, frankly, I think need to be much larger around ethics, around AI, thinking about kind of how these products, what the, the second or, order effects are of these products, like what are the unintended consequences of having this kind of a device in the world or in your home? And there is work to be done there that is just starting that really needs more of. Um, so 
you know, there's, there's a lot about humanity and how we interact with technology. If you are interested in art um, and in design, there's a whole design component. Um, our team has a mix of different types of designers, industrial designers who are thinking about the design of the physical product and how people are going to interact with it, um, user experience and user interface designers who are thinking about the design of the screen and um, the app that accompanies the robot. And then we also have um, writers and animators who are thinking about how do we communicate different concepts? How do we ensure that we're um, effectively, you know, communicating with users and introducing concepts um, to them? So they, they, and they create visualizations and they animate, um, you know, different ideas. And then they're writing out all of the copy, the text that goes into the app and into those messages. So there's all sorts of things you can do. Um, and I also will say that all of the engineers that we work with are also thinking about people like this can't just be on kind of the people group to think about this is a whole company problem. It's a whole company experience. And so regardless of what you end up going into, being well-rounded, thinking about other humans, doing things that help you build empathy, whether that's theater or writing um, or music art, those are all such valuable skills. Um, one of the kind of examples that I like to give coming back to my like history background is that the very first computer punch card programming system um, that was developed in the early 19th century used punch cards that were based on jacquard weaving. So taking from the textile industry and this idea of using punched cards to tell a machine how to weave fabric, they were using that then to tell a machine how to do math. So, you know, you can come to technology from many, many different places and bring something unique. And that's really important. Um, so I wouldn't, well, obviously like studying programming and learning about technology is, is a wonderful thing that we get to do in school now. I think being able to take other skills and really aiming for that STEAM education is really, really valuable. Thanks so much, Lauren. I love how you uh, mentioned, you know, not just STEM, but STEAM as opportunities or, or avenues through which to enter this field, as well as non-technical. So, um, students uh, can see that you don't necessarily have to be the engineer, you know, you could uh, be the ethics person, you could be the lawyer, the accountant within those uh, companies and organizations. Um, and that, that, you know, you're still a part of STEM and STEAM um, as such. So last question before we turn it over to um, uh, Q&A. Uh, before wrapping up. So for Mass STEM Week, the theme is, uh, the overarching theme is always uh, see yourself in STEM. And so, you know, the idea is that everyone can see themselves as a participant in some way in STEM if that's what they want. Um, and we know that generally there is um, uh, under, uh, represented and uh, underserved students out there in STEM. And that uh, it, in, in general, STEM is really, um, it, it's heavily male, it's heavily white, and we have a lot of students who are not such. Um, and so I wanted to ask, how, how can we, um, or is there anything that we can do to diversify STEM and STEAM even more? Um, whether we have, you know, a woman who's watching this, uh, a person um, of color, you know, um, persons with different abilities watching, um, how can we make STEAM and STEM more accessible to persons like that? Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, let's start again with Lauren this time. Um, I think one thing that has come up a lot in conversations and that is important to keep in mind is that it can't all be on the underrepresented people to advocate for themselves and to um, like be the loudest voice in the room. Obviously, you want to respect what people from that community, whether it's women or something else, um, are saying and you want them to take the lead. But um, especially when we're talking about places where no one that is in that group might be in the room. You can't just be like, well, everything's fine. We're good. Like everybody has to be thinking about it and kind of making space. And so 
I think when we're talking about technology, whether we're talking about kind of how we how we treat our coworkers and what our company systems are or the products that we're building, it's important to keep different kinds of people in mind and think about kind of what your what precedent you're setting and how you can maybe do something better and how you can reach out to make the space you're in more diverse if it isn't diverse already. Thanks so much, Christina. So I think I think it's a few different things. Like one of the things that I think has been an underlying theme in what all of us have said here today is that there is no one path into into STEM or STEAM. That all of us have come into it in in different ways, and I think helping people see that is is important. It's one of the reasons why I like doing panels like this because you know a lot of people will start to feel like okay, if I want to get into STEAM, I have to start writing program with programming when my age is in the single digits. I have to have all of this programming background all throughout you know, my, my middle school experience. I have to take all these programs and programming classes in high school. And by the time I get to college, I have to declare computer science as my major. And I need to already know all of this stuff. That really isn't true. But thinking that can be really intimidating sometimes for people who are coming in without that background. Um, because, you know, you, you, you come in as, as a freshman, if you declare computer science and you see your classmates who already know how to write a program and you don't, it can be very intimidating and it can cause people to, to drop out. So letting people see that that isn't really the only, that the, that the, that's not the only way in and looking for ways to do more with allowing people to find their own way in and recognizing as Lauren said, those of us who might be in it, that just because someone doesn't have your traditional background doesn't mean that you can't do it, that you deserve the opportunity too. And people who have diverse skill sets like that bring a lot to the table. Um, another part of it is kind of looking at um, like the entire process of um, like even, even some of these adjacent things. Like one of the things you see for bias in AI is not just the people who are doing it, but in some cases, the data we collect. Like there was a study uh, a few years ago from, I think it was the University of Virginia, looking at some of the image, the public data sets of images that are out there. And there are things like uh, women are predominantly shown shopping, while men are predominantly shown as coaching. So, you know, looking at even things like that when we're creating data sets that are going to be used and, and using that to train our classifiers that you know, you need to have a diverse training data set too. It can't just be playing into, into stereotypes, both in terms of the products that we build and the, the processes and such that we, that we run. So um, getting to see, you know, get, get having people uh, who don't have that, that traditional background of, of STEM all the way through, like me who, who wrote that first program in college um, and letting people see that, hey, that's okay, I still made it, is, I think is all important. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, Natrice, could you uh, share please some um, what we could do to diversify STEM and STEAM? Yeah, so my uh, my book, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation is um, my offering on that. It's a, a book that talks about equity and um, how it's how it can be applied in STEAM, uh, STEM and STEAM, but specifically STEAM education and maker education. Um, you know, whether I'm teaching in um, Taos, New Mexico with um, students from the Pueblo or I'm in New York City teaching in an urban environment or in Boston somewhere, um, I, I'm always thinking about who's there before I go. I'm thinking about what they might bring to the table. So um, their social experiences, their cultural experiences, their capital, what they call capital, um, their backpack. Um, what they bring to the table and how um, the curriculum or how the um, class will, and it gives them time to connect what they bring with them to what is being taught. Um, so if someone walks into a space and they feel welcome, um, they are more likely to share, to speak up, to feel like they have a voice. If they feel like the voice is important, they're more likely to contribute more often, and they're more likely to feel like that their ideas are valued. Otherwise, they'll stay in their community and not come out. Um, I've had students who've graduated with um, STEM majors. Um, I had a, uh, someone who graduated from Cornell in bioengineering and realized that 
the field didn't have anybody that looked like her um, or she didn't feel well, feel welcome. So even after having gone through and gotten her degree and something that she really liked, which was bioengineering, she was still doubtful if she was going to actually enter the field. Um, and so we look at the numbers and it tells us that we know that 3.9% of African-Americans are in engineering. 10% um, are Hispanic. Um, so we see the numbers show up and the stats um, of, going, of people going into the fields. So even if they're interested in STEM or STEAM, there are messages they're getting somewhere along the line that prevent them from going into those fields. And I think it's not just from home or from school. It's sometimes they'll go on a tour. Sometimes they'll see um, a place and realize, I don't see myself here. Um, I don't feel welcome. And so I think it's important to create spaces where people feel welcome or there's uh, activities or an environment that is conducive to sharing and valuing what, what people have to contribute. Thanks so much for that. Um, I definitely agree. Um, Josh? It's a, oh man, it, it's an access question through and through. You know, we yeah. technology is something where it, the, the, the latest and greatest is always the most expensive. And it creates a story of haves and have nots. And because it's a story of haves and have nots, for, for me personally, the way in which we talk about STEM, the way in which we incorporate STEM and STEM into education needs to be at the forefront. Because, in my opinion, and I feel that, you know, diversity and innovation go hand in hand. The more diverse of a workforce that you're in, the more creative that workforce will be the more they will be able to innovate and have like new different methods of thinking, different perspectives. But yes, it's also about for the, for people who paved the way to be in these spaces, to also make these spaces inviting, you know, like I have my Puerto Rican flag right on my desk. People know when they walk in, okay, that guy, that guy's Puerto Rican. <laughs> but, but the thing about that is, you know, like for other Latinos and Latinx people that come in through the door for the students are like, okay, like I can be a part of this. This is, this is a space where I feel seen. This is a space where I want to be heard. Uh, and just know it's needed. Diversity in technology is so needed. It is something that if we can have a more diverse STEM group of, of, of professionals, which leads from a, a STEM group of pipeline of students and so on, it will create more jobs, it'll create more innovation, it'll create more, more companies, it will create new ideas, it will create new methods of problem solving because you're bringing in different ways of thinking. And that different way of thinking is a value add. It's a value add for every company because perspective, uh, everyone has a different perspective and it's imp impacted by your environment, your social economic background, the, the cycle of socialization. And if you are able to bring that to a company, you will stand out, you will be innovative, you will be welcomed because there can't be everyone in the room nodding, yes, 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 this sounds great because that's not how things get done. You need people who think differently and view things differently. And for the education systems, we, we need to make STEM more accessible through and through. Uh, it needs to be something that school leaders and districts really need to say to themselves, this is the focal point of what we have to do, because it hasn't been for years and that, that disconnect, that drought is impacting us right now. It's, it is the reality of many offices and environments that they just aren't inclusive in ways that they need to be at this time. And we need to really evaluate the system as a whole but at the same time, I know it's a lot for students to take on, but believe in what you believe in, fight for what you want to fight for, uh, be the loudest voice in the room that you need to be. And I know that's hard at times because you might not see other voices being loud with you, but everything that you believe in and, and are fighting for, it's necessary because it's for the greater good of the society as a whole. Thanks so much. You, you know, you all have been, so um, open to sharing uh, this morning. We are absolutely out of time. Um, I, I just want to thank you for um, you know joining us this morning. 
I see that there are no questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and I want to be respectful of your time. I know Nectrice has to jump, so feel free. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for you know, sharing your perspective with the students. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather.